I'd like to say good morning to each one. Good to have each one out this Sunday morning on this um, wonderful day. Pretty outside and warm. A year ago it was 17 degrees. I read that in the paper where it says a year ago the temperature is 17 degrees. So we got a lot to be thankful for. It's good to see each one out this morning. Our attendance was up this morning in Sunday school to 47. We're thankful for that. And our offering this morning through Sunday school was $1,802.19. And last Sunday in worship service, we had 63. And we're certainly thankful for that. And if any of you are visiting with us, and I see we have visitors, we just certainly welcome you to our services today and ask you to join in as Brother Bobby comes and leads us in some worship songs. And again, we're thankful for each one present. I'd like to say a good morning to you. It's a beautiful day. Uh, I want you to join in the song service this morning. Let's sing praises unto the Lord. Well, let's sing happy birthday to a great big guy called Eli. Uh-oh, he's shrunk. He's been trying to hide behind a purse <laughs> and something. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And we'll extend to that to others that are having a birthday. Or <laughs> we invite you to get your hymnals if you like, if you can sing. It'll be on the wall. Great is thy faithfulness. Number 14. Just join right in the song service. Jody, you missed that. You, you ought to seen how, how low he can crawl down in that seat. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow or turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy Bless. 
sings are all mine with thy thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. And if you have the second edition of the Blue Hymnal, we'll go to 99. Because he lives. And it'll be on the board too, won't it? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> because he lives. <clears throat> God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and I fear. The living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still. The calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and in some day. I'll cross the river, fight lies fine, no war with pain. And in as death, his way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I know he lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the fear. And life is worth the living just because he lives. 
And then, in our red hymn law, it is well with my soul, 146. 146. <clears throat> mixed up on me. Praise group. I know that never happens to y'all.
windshield the troubles linger still who shall I feel I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of angel armies is always by my always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies is always by my side i know who goes before me i know who stands behind the god of angel armies is always by my side the is always by my side.
been so kind, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus. out so far. Uh, I'll ask at this time if you can stand with us this morning as we take up this morning's offering. I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way forward. Brother Bruce, would you lead our hearts in a word of prayer? Amen. You may be seated.
for those of you who are sitting up here to the front, you don't know Miss Ruby and Brother Donnie back there uh, and with us this morning. It's, been good, it's good to have you all with us this morning. Uh, I know there's a lot of people here who have missed you all. And you all, we just love you all. We want you all to know that. If you've been with us uh, from the beginning, we've been going through the book of Philippians. And I encourage you to turn there with me. The book of Philippians, we'll be looking at chapter 4. And it, the very first, at the very beginning, Paul is admonishing a life uh, that we ought to have, and Paul looks there, and he wishes that, that this church there in Philippi would have confidence, and we looked at that scripture, being confident, and do you have that confidence that he that began a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ, and that's, what we, that's the kind of life that we ought to have, is a life that is filled with that confidence. Then we looked at love that is abounding. And love that is abounding is based on what? Knowledge and what? Judgment. Because the more that you learn about that person, the more that you love them. The more you love that person, the more you want to know about them. So that knowledge and discernment are built into that love, uh, obviously with our spouse, but also with our Heavenly Father. The more we fall in love with Him, the more we want to know about Him. And, and it just it's a continual cycle. And then last week we looked at the mind of Christ that that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But what did he do? He took on the form of a servant. And, and we were to look at uh, others as being more important than ourselves. And this week we're going to look at, and we're going to exa examine a life that is content. Are you content this morning? I didn't ask you if you were happy. Yeah, some of y'all this. Are you content? Are you content? And uh, I, I thought about titling this message uh, jokingly, you know, content or discontent, which tent do you live in? And it just would never fly, I don't think. But isn't it true that people are, are running around today, they're rushing around, and they're living to get instead of getting to live? And, and they live with this dissatisfaction with their lives, and if you examine the psychology of marketing today, have you ever looked at that? What is, what is the psychology of marketing? They, it's built around this premise is that they are trying to get you dissatisfied with what you have and show that you would be satisfied if you had what they had instead. It's built around that, that idea that I'm going to build in you a sense of dissatisfaction with what you have so that you might be satisfied with my product. That's why they say things like, you owe it to yourself. Can you imagine how happy you would be if you had this product? And they always show the commercial, right, with everybody smiling, right? And you say, man, I, I bet if I had that, I'd be smiling too. They don't show you all the debt that they've accrued. Now, my, favorite, my favorite commercial was the guy mowing around his yard, and he's, he's in the local clubs and all that stuff, and he says, how do I afford this? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. And that's, and that's what's so true sometimes, the people who are continually dissatisfied with what they have is that it's, it's marked by debt. And like I said, they have the catchphrases, you deserve it. You've got it coming to you. Experience the happiness that comes with owning... Boy, I think I could pitch a commercial right now, right? Philippians chapter 4, let's look at the scripture together. Philippians 4, verse 10. Paul writing here from a, get this, I want you to understand, I want you to get the backdrop of this. Paul is writing to this church in Philippi from where? From a Roman jail. Now, let that sink in as you read this together. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Well, would you rejoice in jail? I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at this at the last, your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever sta whatsoever state I am in, or I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. What is that verse that we all know? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Let's pray together. Father, I come before you and ask simply that, Lord, that your word would not just reach our ears, but, Lord, that it would reach into our hearts. Lord, that it would affect 
the way that we think, that we would learn to be content with the things that you have given us. And Lord, that we would not be dissatisfied with what we don't have, but again, being joyful over the things that you have given us. Lord, I pray that, you know, we walked in a certain way, but Lord, I pray that this message that you have for us this morning would cause us to walk differently than when we came in this morning. Lord, be magnified here in the sight of your people, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I want, I'm going to give you a definition. Contentment is that inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of our outward circumstances. I'm going to say it again because I know it's a... All right. Contentment is an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. It has the idea that it is self-contained. Bear this in mind. Remember, I said, Paul is writing this not from the Holiday Inn Express. Okay? He's writing this from a jail cell. And he's saying, I want you to be content. Now, if there's anyone who should be discontent about his current circumstance, who should it be? Paul. And yet, from his jail cell here in prison, he's admonishing people who no doubt have it better than he has to be content. Why can't Paul say this? Because if you have, get this, if you have Jesus, you really quite literally have all that you need. Let that sink in. If you have Christ, you should have everything that you need. Because everything that we need is found in him anyways. And Jesus is all you need. Now, contentment, I want to I preface this a little bit. Contentment is not complacency. That's not, see how little you can get by with. It's, you need to have a zeal, a passion to work, but it shouldn't drive you, right, to be discontent with what you have. You can have possessions. Amen. It is not wrong to have possessions. Y'all are very reluctant for an amen this morning. It is not wrong for you to have possessions, okay? I know that... Amen. Thank you. You can be content by having possessions, and you can be content without having possessions. <laughs> you can be content. You, Paul said he learned that whatever state he was in, therein to be content. He knew that to, he knew what it was like to barely get by, and he knew what it was like to have excess. And did you know that being rich is not a sin? It's not a sin. Let me give you some scripture. You can put this in your margin if you'd like. There in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. For it is he that gives thee the power to get wealth. Who is that? God gives you the power to get wealth. Let me give you another one. He also takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Who is that? God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his service. Now, it doesn't mean he wants to give you a BMW, a house, and all that. He takes pleasure in knowing that you're taken care of. Okay? And he is the one that gives you the power to obtain wealth. And we know this from James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? It's from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So let me say this. In an anti-Platonism kind of way, material is not evil. Okay, I know, you, I know you, Platonism and all that stuff, I, I threw that in there. I've been studying that a little bit. But materialism is not evil. Or material is not evil. Materialism is evil. But material itself is not evil. Now, we need to look at, first and foremost, what destroys contentment? What, what makes you dissatisfied with what the way things are? And that's what the very first thing I want you to say is, if you've got notes, what is it that destroys contentment? And it's the 10th commandment there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's manservant, maidservant, his ox, his ass, nor anything that is thy servant's. Why is it there at the very end? Why did God put that commandment last? Because it encompasses all the commandments. All the other commandments deal with what you do. Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. But this one deals with your attitude. One deals with your actions, this one deals with your attitude. And, and, and your attitude 
Covetousness is that unlawful desire that comes out of being discontent. Now, why is covetousness so bad? So, Brother Heath, there's a lot of, there are nine other commandments that are above that tenth one that are much worse than covetousness. That's why we have to look at one thing. Covetousness is deceitful. It is very deceptive. Saul, before he was converted... You know, Saul was a pretty good guy. Did you know that? He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was, he was a guy that knew the law. He had memorized the entire Old Testament. How many of you have memorized the entire Old Testament? And even memorized the begats, the begats, the begats, the begats. He knew them all. He knew it backwards, forwards, sideways. He knew it. And he says there in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, there was something very distinct that hit Paul. He said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but what? By the law. For I had not known what? Lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And it's just like, I can see Paul, he's got this checklist. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. Check. You shall not make into to thyself a graven image. Check. And he gets all the way down there, to the bottom. And then it says, thou shalt not covet. And he could not check it. Why? Because he said, I knew then that I was a sinner. I had not known sin but by the law until the law said you should not covet. I knew that within myself dwells no good thing. And that's what we see here taking place. You can clean up the outside is what this is showing. You can do all the good things. You can go to church. You can give money to the church. You can get active and come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But then God turns on the x-ray. And he looks on the heart. And he sees what's inside. And that should concern us. And, and that's what's so deceptive about it. It's because you, ne you don't necessarily see it. Did you know what's so deceptive about it? You could be covetous and not even know it. That's what's so deceptive about it. But it's deceitful. But I want you to see next, it's also debasing. And, and Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, what precedes what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts. And I even underlined it for you so you can see it. Covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. For all these things, these evil things come from where? From within. And they defile the man. Remember I gave that illustration. When you see that wormhole in that apple, you know that, that the worm's gone. Why? Because it burrowed out of the apple. It was born inside the apple. So where does all the sin, where does all this stuff come from? God would tell you simply, it came from within. Where does the, and did you notice the, the company that covetousness there kept? It was a pretty, pretty bad list. It says wickedness, deceitfulness, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Now, did you know that little children are covetous? You say, not my angel. Let me, give you a, let me give you an illustration on this. You can put a child in a room with 15 toys. All of them are good toys. All of them work, none of them broke. And then you can put another child in that same room, and what toy does he want? the one the other one's playing with. Covetousness is there right from the very beginning. It come, I mean, that's where it comes from. It comes from within. We want what the other person has, and we cannot be content with what we have. Think about this. How did Satan tempt Eve? This is, this is, I didn't think about this until I, I really sat down with this. How did Satan tempt Eve? Through covetousness. Think about that. She could have ate from any tree in the whole, quite literally the whole world. But there was just this one tree that she couldn't. And she wanted that one. Why? Because it wasn't hers. Covetousness is a very subtle sin. It's a very debasing sin. But I want you to see, finally, it's also a very destructive sin. I know we don't see the, the seriousness of it, but it is very destructive. And I want you to look at this, what Paul told a young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says in verse 9, But they that, I want you to see that, I underlined it so that you'd see it. 
They that will be rich, not that they that are rich, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and, an, and, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted, there's that word again, after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I have to put to you there that it says that they will be rich. That is, they have set their affections, they have set their goals of becoming rich. And they fall into destruction. It's such a destructive and sinister sin that did you know that you can't serve God and be covetous? You cannot serve God and be covetous. Don't hate me on that. That's exactly what Jesus himself said. Matthew 6, he says, No man can serve two masters. And a lot of people say, Well, Brother Heath, where's in the scriptures where a man shouldn't have more than one wife? Right there. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And what's, what, is the, what is so bad... What is so idolatrous that we would say that we would hate God and love something else? You, can't serve lo you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I know that y'all don't have the Greek Bible or whatever right there in front of you, and so in my scholarly uh, studies, I found out what that word mammon means. It means stuff. And isn't it true that anything other than God, it's just stuff? You can't serve God and stuff. Because you'll love one or you'll hate the other. And that's exactly what he's saying here is you can't serve God and pursue after wealth. And pursue after at the abandonment of serving God. You cannot serve God and money or stuff. God doesn't take second place. If he is second place in your life right now, can I tell you, you are right now in an idolatrous relationship and you need to repent of it. It's just clear and simple. We, we, have to, we have to put Christ at the forefront because he deserves it. Isn't he worthy to deserve that from at least, I mean, from us? All things came from him. Everything that you ever had, everything that you will ever have, came from Him, will come from Him. So how do we become content, right? How do we overcome being discontent? And how do we become content? In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. Now, that word mortify means put to death. That means kill it. Now, if you get rid of something, you've got to replace it with something. So if we get rid of covetousness, what are we going to replace it with? Contentment. That's what it's supposed to be, is contentment. So we've got to look at what defines contentment. What defines contentment? Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 5. Let your conversation or your behavior... Be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. And how are you to do that? For, at, for, at, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So how are we to be content? As I said before, if you got Jesus, you have everything. He says he'll never leave you, nor will he forsake you. It is enough. He is quite literally enough. And Paul was admonishing Timothy. In that, that same chapter, he says, But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Great gain. So what develops contentment? How do we develop contentment? Now, Philippians chapter 4. I underlined it there for you. Now that I... Paul's again speaking. Now that I speak in respect of want, for I have what? Learned it. Did you know that contentment is something that's learned? None of us came into this world knowing what it means to be content, really. Did you know it is something that is actually learned? Now, being content, as remember, is that inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of our outward circumstances. 
So what does it mean to have enough? To be sufficient and have enough? He tells you. In 1 Timothy verse 6, again verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. What does he say after that? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. What's enough? Having food, having raiment, let us therewith be content. I know that you all have clothes, and I know that here about noon, everyone in here is going to have food in their belly. That should be enough. If you have Jesus, and you have those basic physical needs, it's enough. It's enough. It's okay if you don't have the latest car. It's okay if you don't have certain things. If you have Christ, you have enough. If you have something... Be thankful for what you do have, not what you don't have. And that's what I want to do right here, is I want to give you some practical things. And I have them there for you in your notes. Some practical ways um, to, be, to learn contentment. If God is the source from which all good things come from, spend time with Him. I remember in the book, I think David Platt's book, Radical, I can't remember if it was him or if it was uh, Francis Chan's book, but he talks about a dad who, who uh, takes his son and he has some quality time with his son and he takes him to Mickey D's. And he goes there and you can't just eat one fry, you know that, right? So he buys his son some fries and, and he sits down with his son and, and he desires to have one of his son's fries and he's reaching for his son's fries. Keep in mind, the dad paid for it. And the son said, no, that's mine. And the dad just kind of sits there and he folds his arms back and says, son, I bought that. I could go back there and buy $20 worth of fries and bury you in it. And I can take it away. What's this mean? God gave you everything. What right do you have to say, it is mine? He wants to share, the, this, the story is the dad wanted to share in this time of fellowship with his son, but the son wouldn't share what the dad had blessed him with. And isn't it true that we can get so caught up in our stuff, that mammon, that we can just miss out on having that relationship with God? So can I give you the first thing? Is to have, to cultivate a relationship with God. And the second thing is, is that be thankful for what you do have. Covetousness is based on looking at what you don't have. Being content is being thankful for what you do have. And let me give you the last one there. Be generous. Be generous. You know how you overcome covetousness, greed, and all that? Start giving money away. Start giving things away. You cannot be covetous and keep and, keep and hang on to those things. Once you give it away, it's gone. You know, God desires to have a relationship with us. And He doesn't want anything to come in between us. And if in this moment, and, we, and we're going to go ahead and prepare for our invitation, if in this moment, there is something standing between you and that relationship with God, would you give it up? Would you give it over to Him? It's not worth it. It really isn't. It's just like that dad with those fries right there. He could buy you $20 worth of fries. More than you could eat. It could come out of your nose. He could give you more than you want. Why are you so bent on those little things that you're hanging on to that's keeping you from having that relationship? If you don't have a relationship with Christ, can I say this? There is no sin that you, that you would cling on to that's worth it. Did you know that, that the wages of sin was death? It will take you to your grave. It will destroy you. But can I, t can I give you some good news? That Jesus Christ was destroyed on a cross. He was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. And if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that He has taken your sin. He died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again, and he promises eternal life to anyone who will call upon his name to believe in that salvation. I like what Brother David Enzer says, and I use it all the time, I can't help it. If you believe right now that Jesus Christ 
would save you from your sin if you'd call on him right now? Do you believe he would? If so, why, why tarry? Go ahead and call upon his name. You don't have to walk this aisle to have that done, but if you need help, if you need some, uh, some understanding, I'm here to do that for you and with you. But you can call upon him right from where you are. And if you call upon him, if you believe on him, you will not be ashamed, the scripture says. That means you will want to tell somebody about it. I mean, who better to tell than the church to come before this body who would rejoice in that salvation that we've all experienced here. We've all, anyone who has placed faith in Christ here would just rejoice in that knowledge that you've called on him.